Alhamdulillah, we just came in from Singapore. We had a night last night, and Alhamdulillah, it went um, great. And I'm happy to be here with you again. My topic is one that's very dear to my heart, and it's a topic uh, which I think many of us take for granted. But it's a very, very, very powerful tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. In fact, it's a very powerful gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, and that is the topic of dua. Dua is... You know, before we can talk about dua or before I begin to talk about dua, I want to first set the groundwork and talk about the importance and the power of dua. Why is dua so important that the Prophet ﷺ referred to it as ibadah itself? Al dua huwa al ibadah, al dua mukh al ibadah. That dua is the, the mind or the head of, of, of worship or in another hadith that dua itself is worship that the prophet sallam is equating dua and worship why is it so important that he's doing that so i want to talk first about the importance of dua the power of dua and then i want to get into some of the obstacles what are some of the things that pre pre prevent us from from really using this gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and then I want to give you guys some glimpses into some of the my own favorite adaya and also the duas that we are told about in the in the Quran and in the Sunnah to begin with dua the importance of dua to start out with let me ask you this question have you ever had a really really close friend or someone that you really loved now if you think about that person whether it was your mother or your best friend or your sister or your brother or whoever it was or your spouse. Now, my question to you is that person, how often and how did you communicate with that person? If you told me that actually we never really communicated, then I would tell you that you're probably lying about the strength of your connection and the strength of your relationship and the strength of your bond. Because if you never communicate with someone, there's no way you're going to have a strong bond with that person, correct? But the, in fact, when you look at that person, whoever it is that you're closest to and that you feel, you know, the strongest bond to, and you look at your type of communication, you find that it is of a certain nature. Number one is that it is consistent, right? You talk to that person consistently. You talk to that person often. And the second is that when you talk, there is some meaning to your language. You're not speaking a language you don't understand, for example. When you communicate with your friend, when you communicate with this person, your mother or your spouse or whoever it is, you don't communicate in Chinese, if, assuming you don't understand Chinese, or Italian or French, or some language that you don't understand. Why is that? Because you're not going to build a bond with someone when you're communicating in a language you don't even understand. That's not actually communication. That's just words. So you're, you're, you consistently speak, you consistently communicate, and you communicate in a way that is meaningful, that is meaningful to you and that is meaningful to the other person. Now when we talk about dua, what is dua essentially? Well, let me ask you a question. What does a beggar look like? In fact, what does a beggar do with his or her hands? As you know, a beggar, all, you know, this is kind of a universal language of begging, isn't it? It doesn't matter what country you're in. The universal language of begging is this, right? What do we do with our hands when we make dua? Exactly the same thing. And that shows us exactly what dua really is. Dua is us begging from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is the point of begging Allah? Because you might say that when I beg from a human being, it pushes the human being away from me. And that's actually very true about human nature. Human nature is such that we don't like beggars. Human beings get turned off and repelled by beggars. If someone is too needy, it actually pushes you away. It actually, it actually separates or, or weakens the bond when a human being is too needy of another human being. We as humans, we don't like beggars. But there's someone who loves beggars. And that is Allah. 
Allah loves beggars. And the more we beg from Allah, the more Allah is pleased. Versus the more we beg of human beings, the more they are displeased. This is the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus the creation. Is that Allah loves for us to beg. And something else that we learn is the more that we humble ourselves, the more we put ourselves down with Allah, the more He elevates us and, and raises us. Versus with the creation. It's the opposite. When we put ourselves down and when we become dependent upon the creation and when we become beggars of the creation, we actually become humiliated. This is why, for example, we see ourselves as an ummah at large in a humiliated state because we're like beggars of the rest of the world sometimes. We, we ourselves are not, we are not self-sufficient. We don't, we don't depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We depend on the creation and when we do that, we become humiliated, we become weak. But when we do that with Allah, when we humble ourselves with Allah, and when we beg from Allah, He actually elevates us. He actually makes us stronger and He elevates us and He raises us up. So it's the opposite. The more we need Allah, the more Allah makes us rich. The more we need of the creation, the more we become poor. This really is part of the design of the universe, the design of Tawheed essentially, because what it does is it directs us back to the source. Because if I'm going and I'm knocking on every door, right? I'm knocking on the first door and I'm begging for something. And that person who opens the door, just slams the door in my face, says I have nothing for you, then I'm gonna go to the next door, right? And I'm gonna try again and I'm gonna knock again at the next door and I'm gonna beg and I'm gonna ask for things. And then when that door gets slammed in my face, I'm going to go to the next door. What is happening is these doors are being slammed in my face when I am seeking from the wrong source. So when I'm seeking, for example, let me make it practical. This is a metaphor. <laughs> let me make it practical. When I am seeking for acceptance, when I am seeking for respect, when I am seeking for, the, for approval, when I want another human being to make me feel like I'm okay, to make me feel like I'm worthy, what ends up happening is I don't even get that. I get doors slammed in my face. And that's because I am seeking worthiness from the wrong door. I'm seeking worthiness from the wrong place. I'm seeking approval from the wrong place. I'm essentially trying to please the wrong object. I am, I, I am, I'm, a, I'm trying to please and I'm putting my effort into pleasing the wrong object. When we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, we're saying something very, very powerful. And we know this is very powerful because it was only la ilaha illallah that made the Quraysh fight the Prophet ﷺ. And throughout time, the people who fought the Prophets fought them because of la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is so powerful that it is this which saves us. It is this statement that when we die upon it becomes our salvation. This is a very powerful statement. But it's not just a statement of the tongue, as you know. It's not just a statement of the tongue. The people who it is only a statement of the tongue actually may not even be given permission to say it at the time of death. Because if for me, it's not here, it's not in my heart, then when I'm dying, I can't speak. I can't speak it. And you know and I know many stories, which you can tell more than I can, of people at their deathbed who are being told, say la ilaha illallah, repeat after me, and they can't say it. We all have heard of these stories, right? Instead, the person is saying something else or gibberish or talking about numbers or, or math or, or song lyrics or something. They can't say la ilaha illallah at death. Why does that happen? That happens because if a person doesn't live la ilaha illallah, if a person doesn't carry la ilaha illallah in their hearts, then they can't say it when they die. Because at death, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that at death, 
This is when um, فَكَشَفْنَ عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ That at the time of death, Allah takes away this غِطَاء, this veil over our eyes. We are all walking around with veils, and people, some people's veils are thicker than others. But every, you know, we have this some, some semblance of a veil over our eyes, where we aren't really seeing the reality, capital R. We aren't really seeing the reality. And the reason we don't see the reality, capital R, is because of a lot of distractions and a lot of deceptions that we have in our lives. Sometimes it's our own sins that create the veil. Our sins create this veil and make it layer upon layer. Our distractions, our attachments, the things that we love as we should only love Allah become layers of veils in front of our eyes. And that's why we don't see things as they really are. We don't understand things as they really are because of all these layers and layers and layers of veils in front of our eyes. But when we die, Allah says, فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ That at this time, your veil, we have taken and removed the veil over your eyes. And on this day, your eyesight, your sight is sharp. It's keen. It's keen. And you are able to see all of a sudden the reality exactly as it is. That's why Fir'aun, even Pharaoh, even Fir'aun, when he's dying, he wants to believe now. He, he sees the reality at that point. He, his veil was taken over his eyes. He's no longer saying, Ana rabbukum al -ala. He's not saying that anymore. He's not standing up and saying, I am your Lord most high. He's realizing at that point the reality. But at that point, Allah says, Al -an is, now it's too late at that point. Once that, that point comes where, where, where it has already reached us, it's too late. And those people who lived La ilaha illallah in their lives are given the privilege of saying La ilaha illallah at their deathbed. This is something that every single one of us should pray for and make dua for every single salah. Asking Allah, begging Allah for a good ending. Begging Allah to die on La ilaha illallah. That's all that matters. That's all that's going to matter. It isn't going to matter what you, what you did on XYZ day, what you wore, how much money you made, how many likes you got on a status. All that stuff's not going to matter. What's going to matter is in what state you died. In what state your heart was in when you died. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Allah said, or, uh, on the tongue of Ibrahim. Ibrahim tells us this reality in his dua وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ And do not disgrace me on the day when all of them are brought back. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُوا مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ The day when no wealth and no children will benefit anyone. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except for the one who returns to Allah, who comes back to Allah with a heart that is salim. With a heart that is salim. What is a heart that is salim? One of the best definitions I can, I can tell you of a heart that is salim is a heart that has no competitor with Allah inside of it. This doesn't mean a person who doesn't love their family, doesn't love their job, doesn't love their fancy car. Fine, love those things. But those things should never compete with your love for Allah. And Qalbun Salim is a heart that doesn't have those competitors in love and doesn't have those competitors in hope and in fear and in dependency and in trust, in tawakkul. Because that heart is a heart of tawheed. La ilaha illallah is a very powerful statement. And what that statement is saying is that there is nothing worthy of being an ilah except Allah. In other words, there is nothing worthy of being an ilah except for God. What is an ilah? What is an ilah? An ilah at the very root is an object of adoration and worship and refuge. It's really essentially that place that you go to when you're at your lowest. It's what you put at the center of your existence. 
La ilaha illallah means that you acknowledge that it is only God who has that place, not anything else. Even your own family, even your own children, even your own spouse, even your own money. And when you put Allah in that proper place, then what happens is the rest of your relationships become healthy. We're not talking about a religion without compassion, without mercy, without love. This isn't a cold-hearted concept. This isn't, this isn't about just be cold, you know? Be cold to the creation. Don't have attachments. Be cold. That's not what it means. It's the opposite. When you have the proper place for Allah in your heart, then all of the rest of your relationships actually transform to being healthy. Going from being unhealthy to being healthy. Your relationship with your job becomes healthy. Your relationship with your spouse becomes healthy. Your relationship with your co-workers, your family, your money becomes healthy. And, and you become a person of compassion and mercy. Why? Because you're not a beggar of the creation anymore. When you spend your time begging from Allah, you become rich, right? Because you're begging from the one who is the most rich. Al Ghani, he's, he's self sufficient. He doesn't need anyone. His kingdom doesn't diminish, no matter how much he gives. As, as the hadith tells us, if every single individual were to come together, every human being from the beginning of time until the end of time were to come together and then ask Allah for something, and if Allah were to give every single one of them what they asked for, it would not diminish his kingdom any more than if you take a needle and put it in the ocean or in the sea, it diminishes the ocean. Allah is the most rich. So if you are a person who spends your nights and your days begging from the most rich, what does that make you? Makes you rich. And when a person is rich, are they generous or are they stingy? Are they kind or are they harsh? When a person is rich, then they can be generous. And that's how you become compassionate towards the creation. That's how you become merciful towards the creation. That's how you become generous towards the creation. That's how the Prophet ﷺ was what he was. He was, mercy, he was the epitome of, of human mercy. He was the epitome of human compassion. Why? Because he was rich. He didn't beg from the creation. He begged from the king. And that's how he became rich inside. And that's how he became loving and compassionate and merciful. So don't let anyone tell you that talking about don't have attachments means that you're going to be cold-hearted. It doesn't mean that you're cold-hearted. It means the opposite. It means that you are generous. It means that because you're, you're seeking from the right source, then you are already rich and you have so much to give. When you give from a place of richness, you don't need to be selfish. You don't need to demand. It's like, you know, oh, you know, um, October 3rd, 2001, I did such and such for you. When are you going to pay me back for it? You know, keeping track of everything that you've done for people and waiting for them to pay you back, waiting for them to do something in return. You don't need to be like that because you're, you're being filled by Allah. You're already rich and your source doesn't diminish. So you don't need to go to the beggar and beg. You give, you give, and you don't need to be demanding and you don't need to be weak and you don't need to be in need of others who are also in need. You see, when you go to a poor part of town, you never see a beggar begging from another beggar. Do you? Does that happen? It's ridiculous, right? Beggars don't beg from other beggars. Why? Because a beggar knows that the beggar is just as in need as the other beggar. He's just as poor. Why would I beg from another beggar? I need to go to the one who's rich. You see my point? So whatever it is that we need, essentially we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it because Allah is the source. Now does that mean I can't go to people for help? Does that mean that because I am asking Allah and I make my dua and I beg from the source that I can't go to people for help, for example, to, you know, a therapist, a counselor, a doctor? And the answer, of course, is I can. These are something that Allah has, has, has created called asbab. Asbab meaning the means. These are means. 
Just like I take medicine when I'm sick. That's a means, and that's, that's part of our deen to use the means. It's part of our deen to go and seek help when I need help. That's okay. What is the problem then? The problem is when I depend on the means instead of just using it. It's when I'm depending on the medicine instead of on Allah. It's when I'm depending on the doctor instead of a shafi, the one who actually cures. It's when I'm depending on this person who's giving me advice or this person who's giving me counsel instead of on Allah. I just need to realize that Allah is the source and Allah is in control and everything else is in His hands and they are means, asbab. That doesn't mean I can't use and, 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 and involve myself in the asbab, but my dependence should be on Allah. الأرض ميدان